should bow your heads and pray with me. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And Heavenly Father, give us joy, Lord, in that gracious invitation you give us to confess our sins to you, for you hear us. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're continuing our 40-day forgiving challenge journey. And if you remember correctly, if you, if you haven't been here every week, I'll just kind of give you a brief recap. Um, we started by talking about scars. And our scars that we bear in our lives, some could be external, certainly, but most of them usually are internal scars, can threaten to define us, can enslave us. But ultimately... The scars of Jesus are the scars that define us and ultimately enable us to heal. And what we're doing here through this series is we're defining this five phases of freedom, basically through the examination of ourselves and and recognizing how that process goes when when the grace of Jesus comes in contact with our sinful lives through that uh, that word scars. We're using this acronym and you can see it on the screen in front of you. Last week we started with the first S. And we took a look at that whole concept of of sin. Sin is a word which means really to be curved in on yourself. Another way that we talk about it is to to miss the mark set by a holy God. To be holy is to be set apart. And so in our lives, in various ways, we miss the mark that God would want us to hit. And according to God's word, this sin that we all have, it's something we all have inside of ourselves, it, it enslaves us. Of course, the opposite of slavery is, is freedom. But first, in order to be free from sin, you need to understand what sin is and then understand that process that God uses to free us. So, this leads us to the daily reality that we all experience. Sin is a very real thing. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Nobody is without sin. And I think it's important, and this is actually a... a, a a humble recognition in all of our lives. We try our hardest, but we're never going to be everything that we want ourselves to be this side of heaven. The reality is we are going to sin. We do sin, oftentimes without even trying, and oftentimes trying our best not to. And so what's important for us is to understand, recognize what we do after we sin. What are are the daily temptations that we fall into when sin happens? I would argue that there's probably, you could say, three categories. There's more, but three that pop to the top of my head. One thing that we're oftentimes tempted to do is deny it. No biggie. Or you do you, things like that. I still remember as a, as a, as a child, my grandma was always, always famous for saying no biggie. I, <laughs> now I look back on it like I still spilled grape juice on, the, on her carpet. My mom's like, I, I really did. And she's like freaking out. My grandma's like, no biggie. Well, it kind of was, but not. You know, it's grandma. You know, you're just kind of used to that response. But we do that in our lives in all sorts of different ways. We just kind of declare the thing to not be a big deal. We deny it. Another thing that we do is um, we're very good at blaming others. That person over there. Why are you making me feel this way? Or, you know, I had no choice because they fill in the blank. The other person's sinfulness or what they did or the choices that they've made are the reason why and therefore we minimize. Or maybe we just cover it up entirely. Keep it secret. Manage it. This thing over here, well, I can deal with it on my own. Or... I just won't talk about it at all and hope nobody notices. Truth is, any response, anything we do after sin that doesn't involve bringing it to Jesus will leave us all enslaved. I think we need to understand that. Why is that? Well, because deep down inside, no matter what we say, no matter what we project outwardly, we all know that we're, we're guilty. We all struggle with I think in some degree, shame to some, some degree, sin threatens to define us. And any pursuit other than Jesus is going to lead us to further bondage. We're learning about that with Jonah. If you've been coming here and listening to our weekly sermons, our midweek sermons talking about Jonah's, uh, Jonah's own challenge. 
So this is where we, we go. Where, where does God want us to turn after we sin? Well, that leads us to the second letter, which is C. And that's confession. Okay, now what do you think about? Now that word, confession. What are the things that go through your mind? It's kind of a loaded term. You know, some people may think of a confession booth. You know, like the person confesses their sins to the priest. That sort of thing. Um, that's not the first thing that pops into my head, but maybe if you have a Catholic background or something like that, it might be the first thing that pops in your head. Another thing that might pop in your head is our traditional Lutheran confession at the beginning of a service. We've, done this, we've, we've spoken this confession repeatedly. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. You know, there's beauty to these words because it really unpacks a number of things. First of all, that sin is not just something that people outwardly see. It's through my thoughts, my words, and my actions. So sin is multifaceted. And then also it talks about sins of commission, the things that I've done, and also sins of omission, things that I have not done but should have done. And that's the beauty of that confession is it unpacks sin in a number of different ways. But I want to define confession this way today. A modern courtroom setting where a criminal admits to a crime. Here we go, confession. Confession, by the way, it oftentimes is defined as saying the same thing as, so it's agreeing with. God says we're sinners, so in other words, it's a way of confessing or agreeing with God. A formal statement admitting one is guilty of something. Isn't that kind of scary? <laughs> I found out about this myself. Um, earlier this year, I made the beautiful decision as I was leaving my subdivision in a hurry in the morning to drive by a bus that was parked in my neighborhood with the stop sign out. And I looked around, I'm like, no, you got to get going and on and then. You know, my boys told me I should have stopped. I didn't. I got a call from a police officer. I got to go to the North Royalton Police Station, and I got to go in front of people there and say, I did something wrong. Actually, just two people, but it's embarrassing. And, and I'm like, I, I am at a, I, I'm a pastor. I'm, I'm saying this to you guys because I'm a pastor at a school, and I'm like, I should know better than this. I did it. And, and it was embarrassing to actually admit that you did something you should not do? It's hard, isn't it? And, and you can make excuses. You can say, I was in a hurry. I, I, you know, there was nobody there. But what's the law? Stop. Well, I think it's fair to say for all of us that we all find ourselves in situations like this. Oftentimes things that Maybe nobody's calling us to name. By the way, I had to pay a hefty fine. We're all good now. What's most important really is what we do after we sin. We admit it. In humility, consider others more significant than yourself. The Apostle Paul said that, right? And it says this in 1 John chapter 1. Let's go ahead and read this together. If we say we have no sin... We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. One of the challenges I actually would like to give you is to memorize this. Be able to say this on your own. There's power in, in committing God's word to memory. Because when things happen, when you're tempted to, for example, justify or make excuses or point the finger at someone else, having a passage like this in our hearts is really important. So that is one thing I would actually challenge you for this week is to memorize that verse. Everyone has committed sin. If any of us say otherwise, we're lying. There is a connection also. Take this to heart, my friends. There's a connection between evangelism, proclaiming God's the gospel message to others, and confession. Think about this. Doesn't God do some of his best work through those who are willing to admit they're weak, they're broken, and their lives aren't entirely put together? The world would say otherwise. 
put out the best image you possibly can, but Jesus himself said to the Apostle Paul, my power is made perfect in your weakness, right? Confessing our own weaknesses is, is to truly recognize we need the grace of Jesus. We need his forgiveness. All of us do. And brokenness is meant to lead us to God's power. I mean, this is what you learn through Jonah. This storm that God hurled at Jonah as he was running away saying, nope, not going to Nineveh. It was meant to turn him back to God and his saving power that he wanted to be shared with the Ninevites. When you know you are weak, then you will know also how strong he is. Well, we're digging into how Jesus forgave Peter. We're going to be doing this for a few weeks now. And uh, Luke chapter 22, I'm actually putting this up here. I will be having you open up your Bibles in a second. But Luke chapter 22 is where we hear about Peter's denial. And Pastor Sweeney covered this a bit last week. Peter was one of the most outspoken disciples. Was always the first to be like, ooh, ooh, pick me, pick me. That kind of disciple. I think a lot of you know we know this, many of us. And Peter was that disciple who was quick to say, I will do this, I won't do that, right? He was the bold disciple who would step out on the water, right? And, and he's the disciple that we probably know the most about of all the Jesus disciples. And that's why his denial of Jesus is so powerful. When Jesus was, was taken, uh, was arrested and, and was being um, accused of things that he, that he hadn't done, when they were looking to have him killed, which eventually happened, Peter was the one who's sitting outside at a charcoal pit with a bunch of people who said, you're one of Jesus' disciples, aren't you? He said, no, I'm not. Not once, not twice, but three times. And I think that this, this image, it's actually a beautiful image here because you can see in this image, if you, if you can, I know it's, it's a little dark, you can see Jesus on the top. But in Luke 22, 61 through 62, it says, And the Lord turned and looked at Peter, and Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. It describes guilt, but I think it also describes shame. Is this who I am? Am I really somebody that's just only going to look out for myself? For around three and a half years, Jesus, Peter followed Jesus. And when the rubber hit the road, when it was his life or Jesus' life, whose life mattered most to Peter? His own. So I think that that look that Jesus gave to Peter, that I always found that to be powerful. He looked, he, he looked at Peter and he saw him and he knew what he'd done. Of course, Jesus knew that was going to happen. Peter never thought it would happen until it did. And isn't that how sin oftentimes works? I would never. And then there you are. The beauty of Peter's story is it doesn't end there. You know, in Mark 16, verse 7, Jesus says, after he rose from the grave, he said, go tell the disciples and Peter. That's significant, isn't it? When Jesus rose, he wanted to make sure that Peter was told. He names, he's the only one that he names. Go tell Peter. Jesus has just risen from the dead, which was to forgive the sins of the entire world, and yet he remembers Peter. I want you to put yourself in Peter's head, if you can, if you you might. It's been three days. Mrs. Triplett did a great job of outlining that. You know, not three full, but it's been three days, okay? And he's been, at this point, he would have been sitting in his sin. Just sitting, thinking about what happened. What we know about the disciples, they they locked themselves in a room. They were scared. They were nervous. On top of this, Peter had been dealing with guilt. The guilt growing. The shame covering him. I'm guessing not sleeping. Maybe you can relate. And then the same Jesus who looked at him is alive and wants him to know. Uh oh. <laughs> I invite you to open up your Bibles to page 907. We're going to look at the 21st chapter of John, 
specifically verse, verses, uh, well, verses 1, whoop, here we go, through 17. And understanding all this background and what I've already kind of brought to the, to the forefront here, I think this is a good setup for, for taking a look at this, at this account. John chapter 21, verse 1 through 6. So after this, and this is after Jesus appeared to his disciples, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. There's more I could outline here, but the part that I really want you to focus on here is this is not the first time a miracle like this has happened, is it? It's not. Jesus is actually recreating the first time he ever met Peter. So that's kind of interesting. We continue reading in verse 7. That disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. I've always found it interesting how first Peter's the last one to get to the tomb because he's the slowest, and then he's just like throwing himself into the sea. It's, Peter, like, it, it, John was not friendly to Peter in this. <laughs> Peter throws himself into the sea, but he's so anxious to see Jesus. He's so anxious to see him that he just jumps in the water. He's not, he's not willing to wait until the boat gets there. Let's jump ahead to verse 9. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place, which with fish laid out on it, and bread. I didn't read it, but I did mention it earlier. Where else have we seen a charcoal fire? When he denied Jesus three times. It's interesting because charcoal is mentioned twice in the Bible, this word. First time is when Peter denies Jesus three times. Second time is right here for a reason. Verse 10 through 12, Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went, ab went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there, there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. All right, this is significant as well. And you know this from, we, we, from Jesus' own ministry, his time. You see this in, in ancient times. Eating with somebody meant something. It meant intimate fellowship. This is one of the reasons why Jesus got into so much trouble eating with tax collectors and sinners. But Jesus also understood that by doing that, he was making a statement. He was saying something. And Jesus is saying something here as well. To eat with somebody who has done something wrong is a gesture of forgiveness. That's what it is here. He's not excluding Peter. Hey, everybody, all of you, but Peter. You can eat over there. <laughs> no. He invites Peter to eat with him. He's basically saying, Peter, I cooked you a meal. I'm ready and willing to reconcile. Let's look at verse 15. Bump down just a little bit. Verse 15. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Notice how Peter reacts this time. Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. 
How many times did Jesus ask, do you love me? Three. Mrs. Triplett did a wonderful job explaining earlier how there is a great significance with three. I don't think I have to unpack all that. It's because she's already shared. And I think you could probably make the connection here. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three times. Do you see all the dots aligning now? You know, one of the things I find interesting about this is, in a very real sense, shouldn't Peter say, I'm sorry, please forgive me, Jesus? I mean, that's what a good parent would say, right? Say you're sorry. <laughs> Ask for forgiveness. And, you know, there, there's something truth to be said about that, especially amongst human beings. I think the wor words have power and it's important, and we shouldn't diminish those, ever. But was Peter sorry? Was he? What do you think? <laughs> when you think about all the things that have happened up to this point, all of Peter's reactions, of course he was sorry. His sorrow goes all the way back to when Jesus looked him in the eye after he denied him three times, and he couldn't take that back. He wept bitterly. And how does Peter react after the third time Jesus says, do you love me? He grieves. It's like, hits. And I wonder if it was in that moment he finally got it. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe he was so excited to see Jesus that all that stuff suddenly was just like gone. And they were eating. And third time. You know, isn't a confession supposed to be formal, formal or at least vocalized? Well, it's, I think it's a good practice. But Peter's silence also speaks volumes. He saw the charcoal fire, the scene in his head. And the first time, Peter was struck with nothing to say. How about you? What sin are you carrying in your life? You know, unlike our relationships with people, it isn't necessary that we confess our sins to God vocally. He knows our thoughts, and even more so, he knows our hearts. I'd like, you to, I'd like to invite you to go through a little exercise with me. And this may make you a little uncomfortable, but I'd like you to close your eyes. I'm going to ask you some questions, and I just want you to answer these questions honestly to Jesus, to your heavenly Father who knows your heart. Nobody else around you is going to know how you answer. Only your Lord will know. Do you have anything in your life you regret? Do you have anything in your life you're constantly ashamed of? Things that threaten and you feel like oftentimes define you. Have you ever intentionally disrespected a parent or someone else in a position of authority? Have you ever intentionally hurt someone else physically? Have you ever tried to harm yourself? Do you or have you ever struggled with destructive forms of addiction? Have you ever taken something that wasn't yours to take? Have you or do you desire something belonging to another person? Maybe even allowing that to harbor resentment in your heart toward them. Have you ever spoken about someone rather than to them? Using words to tear down rather than to encourage and build up. Have you ever lied to someone 
in an effort to hide your actions. I want you to keep your eyes closed. And I want you to imagine every sin you've confessed as weight. Things that you carry. And in your mind, I want you to put all that weight, imagine putting all that weight in a backpack. And it's so heavy, it's too much to carry on your own. And I want you to include the sin that you struggle with don't even apply to the questions that I asked. Maybe sins that you have a hard time even putting into words. Personal struggles, personal weights that you are carrying that you just wish could be taken off your shoulders. And I want you to put them there too. You can't manage it. You can't defend it. You can't get rid of it. This is just you and your Lord. Now I want you to imagine yourself dropping it at Jesus' feet as he gives his life for you on a cross. Christ came to save sinners. He came for people just like you and me. And when you confess your sins, your sins are forgiven in his name. You can open your eyes now. You know, oftentimes in life we want to run out there and do things for God or others. And honestly, God doesn't need our good works. Our neighbor does. We're always running out to do things. But God wants us to start right here. Come to him. Confess your sin. Be forgiven. And be free. And then go just as Peter did. Live as God's forgiven child in his name. Amen.